Today we are building this very small but relatively high-end gaming PC in the Den A4 SFX. It's super compact at only around 7 litres in total volume and that makes it perfect for a minimal desktop gaming PC or maybe even a slightly portable one. Also at the $1600 US price point, this is likely what I would build personally for that amount of money. All of the parts here are available to buy right now, at least at the time of filming. And if you're interested in building something similar to this, but maybe a couple hundred dollars below or maybe above what we're building here, I'll show you where you'd be best to save or spend that extra money. So pretty excited to show you guys this one because there was quite a bit of thought put into it. And I feel like a lot of you might be after something very similar. So let's go over all of the parts, then the building process, and we'll see how it performs. So as a portable gaming build or even just a minimal desktop gaming PC, you really can't go wrong with building this at the $1600 US price point. All of the parts here just work so well together and that's thanks to using a very space optimized case like the Dan A4 SFX. I believe this case was one of the original sandwich layout PC cases in existence which completely separates the motherboard and power supply into one compartment and the GPU in the other. They're connected via a PCIe riser cable which does of course come included and two slot graphics cards up to 295mm in length are supported. This case is on the pricier end at $220 US but you're just not going to find a 7 litre case this space optimized and well built. Now let's jump into the rest of the parts. For the graphics card we're going with the RTX 2070 Super which makes this build perfectly suitable for gaming at 1440p resolution or high refresh rate 1080p. If you do want to save a bit of cash here you can go with AMD's RX 5700 XT as an alternative and you'll only lose around 5% of gaming performance versus this RTX 2070 Super. However there are only a couple of 5700 XTs that will fit in the Dan A4. Thermal performance is a bit more hit and miss, manually tuning the fan curve doesn't work as well, and you don't get features like accelerated video encoding, DLSS 2.0, or other RTX exclusive features in the selected apps. Personally, as someone who does use video editing and 3D modeling applications that do have RTX accelerated features, I would spend the extra cash to get the RTX 2070 Super. However, if you are just interested in gaming, AMD's RX 5700 XT is also a great choice and you'll also save around $100. This build is also very suitable for NVIDIA's upcoming Ampere GPUs, which we're expecting an announcement on soon and release dates and prices following that. So if you don't need to build something right now and you can wait a couple of months or maybe a few months, then that is honestly what I would recommend. For the CPU, we're going with the 6-core i5-10600K, which is currently the best choice for a sensible high-end gaming processor. Out of the box, the 10600K is extremely close in gaming performance to the significantly more expensive 10900K and can overclock to very similar speeds. This makes the 10600K a great CPU for future GPU upgrades, seeing as it's going to be a while before this processor is bottlenecking the rest of your system, especially if you are in interested in playing more CPU intensive or generally high refresh rate titles, the 10600K is the better purchase over something like a Ryzen 3600 XT or 3700X. Now if you're not playing CPU intensive titles or maybe gaming at lower frame rates, I'd recommend going with either the Ryzen 3300X or 3600 paired with a B450i or B550i motherboard depending on availability and pricing. Now as the 10600K is a fairly easy CPU to run in terms of power requirements, we're going to be slotting that into the fairly modest ASRock Z490M ITX AC motherboard. We don't need a top of the line Z490 ITX board to run this 10 600K and the advantage of this board is that it'll also fit our CPU cooler which no other Z490 ITX motherboard manages to do. The VRM is nothing special on this board, it's just a 5 plus 2 phase configuration with 50 amp power stages but that's perfectly fine for our i5. Overall, for 160 US dollars, you are getting some decent value from this board. The rear I.O. is fairly stacked with USB Type-C and two LAN ports, one of those being 2.5 gigabit. 
Now, one important thing to mention is that the updated model of the Dan A4 SFX, the V4, does have a front USB type C connection. That's this little port right here. So the motherboard that we're actually using for this build won't be able to use that type C port. And if you do want to use that desperately, you will have to go with either a B550i motherboard or an updated Z490i motherboard that does have that connection. The CPU cooler is also a very deliberate choice for this build as it's the best air cooler that I've found to fit in the Den A4 and that's the Alpenphone Black Ridge. This was actually designed by the creator of the Den A4 for this case specifically, which is pretty neat. And that means that the clearance height completely maxes out what this case will allow. One thing I do recommend though is swapping the stock 92 mm fan that comes with the Black Ridge cooler to a much quieter Noctua variant of the same size. I found that to improve both noise and thermal performance. For memory, we're going with a low profile Vengeance LPX kit from Corsair, specifically 16 gigabytes clocked at 3200 megahertz. This kit is currently 45 US dollars, which I think is an absolute steal. And I'll also mention that we're purposely going for a low profile kit here so that we can actually fit it underneath our Blackridge cooler. For storage, we're keeping things nice and simple with a one terabyte M.2 P1 stick from Crucial. Just like the memory, this is quite affordable and one terabyte should be enough for most gaming builds out there. As I mentioned, this motherboard does have two M.2 slots, so if you do need to add more storage down the road, that shouldn't be too hard to do. The power supply is a pretty standard recommendation for most ITX gaming builds. This is the SFX 600 Platinum from Corsair. 600 watts is plenty for what you're going to be running within this 7 liter case. The 80 plus Platinum efficiency helps keep things nice and quiet, and this also comes with pre-sleeved cables which is one of the main reasons I'm a big fan of the Platinum series. The one that I'm using for this build does have a swapped fan, but that's not necessary or really recommended to do. This power supply is quiet enough. And lastly, to add some additional airflow to the Dan A4, we're going to be using two of Noctua's slim 92mm fans to the bottom of the case and positioning those as exhaust. The version 4 of the Dan A4, which is what's currently on the market, has two 92mm fan slots, one underneath the power supply and one directly underneath the motherboard. However, the V3, which is what we're building in here, doesn't have that second slot underneath the motherboard. So I'll just be using a single fan underneath the power supply. So with that brief rundown of the parts out of the way, let's go ahead and start putting this thing together. And I think you'll be very surprised with how easy this actually is. Just like pretty much any gaming PC build out there, you'll want to start with the motherboard and the CPU. Carefully unlatch the CPU socket, place the CPU in the correct orientation, make sure it's sitting in there securely, and lock it in by closing the latch. Next, let's go ahead and install our one terabyte M.2 storage drive. Our motherboard has two M.2 slots on the front, which you can access by removing this small heatsink. Either slot is fine, but we're going to use the top one and make sure you remove the film from the thermal pad underneath the heatsink before installation. To secure the drive, you'll actually need one of these very small screws here, which you can find inside the motherboard's box, and then installation is pretty straightforward. Next up is the memory. We've got two DIMMs here that we're installing. Make sure the latches are completely unlocked before pressing them in, and as always, you should hear that nice, satisfying click when they're fully seated. Our Blackridge cooler is next, assuming that you've already swapped the fan to the Noctua Chromax variant with the fan logo pointing down towards the cold plate as shown. Then we need to install the Intel mounting brackets, which just requires four screws. Once that's done, you'll want to apply a generous amount of thermal paste for our CPU. Here I'm using the Arctic MX4 paste, but any high quality paste is okay. Then carefully lining that up with our CPU cooler and then flipping the motherboard and cooler, cooler face down so that we can secure them from the back. Again, just four screws here, just get a couple of rotations on each screw before gradually tightening them all the way up. At this point, you can plug the CPU cooler fan into the appropriate header located at the top of the board and also plug in the cable for our other 92mm fans. If you're using two case fans, not one like we're using, you'll need a fan splitter here instead. 
So now our motherboard is complete and it's clear to see why the Blackridge cooler is incompatible with so many boards. It does occupy quite a bit of space. Now it's time to start working with the Den A4 and first things first, the motherboard's rear IO shield. You'll find this in the motherboard box. It's fairly easy to install. Just make sure you've got it oriented the right way. You'll also want to make sure that you're just working with the bare frame of the case with all of the panels removed. All of the screws are located at the top and bottom. Put these screws aside and make sure your cat doesn't steal them like mine did. Thankfully though we do pass a quick inspection and we're ready to move on. Installing the motherboard is fairly straightforward. The PCIe slot should face upwards towards the riser and if you're unsure what screws to use here you can refer to the Dan A4's user manual. Now you can go ahead and start plugging in some cables. In our case the front USB header and the power switch both located to the right side of the board. And lastly carefully install the the GPU riser cable, a bit of folding here is completely fine and now we're done with this section of the build. You'll want to install your 92mm case fans next with the fan blades facing upwards and at least for the version 3 of the case I needed to use the case fan screws in addition to the rubber mounts that you'd typically use for a 2.5 inch drive. That gets our fan sitting in there nice and solid but I'm not sure what the mounting looks like on the V4 of this case. At this point we're almost done and the next step is to install our SFX power supply with the fan facing outwards for ventilation. You can also plug the extension cable in at this point and I'd recommend organizing it like shown so it doesn't get in the way of the rest of your build. And then comes the dreaded cable management which honestly shouldn't be too hard with a few zip ties and a bit of patience. Just try replicating something similar to what I've done here. The goal is to keep these cables away from the fan directly underneath and also give the fan as much breathing room as possible. Zip ties are definitely recommended here so a handful of those can easily secure things to some kind of rigid form. Luckily we don't need many cables at all for this build so cable management isn't too difficult at all. Now comes the last component to install and maybe the most rewarding and that's the GPU. There are two screws that you'll need to remove at the rear of the case then carefully line the card up with the PTIE riser cable and insert it. We're only using a 270mm long card here so we do get quite a bit of breathing room and installation should be fairly easy. Once the card's fully seated, secure it with those two screws that we just removed at the back. And the very last step, plugging in your GPU's power connectors. Remember the goal of cable management here is to keep the cables away from that bottom fan so I'd recommend feeding them in front of the card and then kind of looping it around at the top like shown. Then that's it, build complete. There's plenty of room for that bottom fan to breathe, cable management looks pretty good, and we're left with a super compact gaming machine ready for Windows 10 installation. I won't be covering that process in this video, the steps are very simple, and I'll link what you need down below in the description. Now let's address probably the biggest concern that most of you might have for a tiny system like this, and that's temperatures. Thankfully, the Den A4 SFX is fairly well ventilated, so although it doesn't have many active fans, our RTX 2070 Super settles in at around 75 degrees C at full load. So not a bad result at all and this was with the stock fan curve which leveled out to a fairly quiet 1900 RPM. Now 75 degrees C is a comfortable level for a graphics card to sit at after sustained full load. But if you do live in a warmer climate or you're running a more power hungry card like a 2080 Ti or you just want a quieter gaming experience and cooler running card, you can do what's called undervolting. I have an in-depth guide on this down below and that's something that I'd highly recommend for a compact build like this and it doesn't take more than a few minutes to set. With the GPU running at a lower voltage, we're able to lower thermals by 7 degrees C, but that's in addition to a lower fan speed as well. Again, I highly recommend doing this and hopefully this difference in noise levels is enough to convince you. Now as the title suggests this is a gaming focused build and that assumes that you're not going to be using this thing for like CPU rendering and encoding. If you do throw the 6 core i5 into something like Blender it does warm up quite a bit so just be mindful of that. 
Let's be honest though, if this is the kind of workload that you're going to be using for this build, then you'd be much better off with an 8-core Ryzen 3700X at this price point. Again, undervolting can be super effective here. We can reduce the average core temperature by over 10 degrees C and bring it down to something a lot more reasonable. This can easily be done by hopping into the motherboard's BIOS and then entering in a negative voltage offset. In my case, I set a quick and easy minus 100 millivolts. If you find yourself crashing in any programs or games, you can just ease the offset to something like minus 70 millivolts and that should be fine. Another thing to keep in mind is that the thermal performance on the version 4 of this case should be slightly better, seeing as you can fit the additional fan underneath the motherboard. Overall though, this is a build guide that I'm really happy that I put together because all of the parts just work so well and this is a configuration that I find myself recommending to a lot of people. If you are interested in building this or something similar, then I will leave all of the parts that you need linked down below in the description. As always, a huge thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.